Expedition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. Army Air Force officers reported that one of the strange ships had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Bill Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucers. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group Headquarters at Rockwell, New Mexico, reports that it has received one of the discs which landed on a ranch outside Rockwell. The disc landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Ranger W.W. W. Grizzell is the man who discovered the problem. Colonel William Blanchard of the Rockwell Air Base refuses to get details of what the flying disc looks like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying choppers to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. In the meantime, General Ramey describes the object as being of flimsy construction, almost like a box tank. He says that it is so fast that he was unable to determine whether it had a disc form, and he does not indicate its size. Ramey says that so far as can be determined, no one saw the object in the air, and he describes it as being made of some sort of tin foil. Other Army officials say that further information indicates that the object had a diameter of about 20 to 25 feet, and that nothing in the apparent construction indicated any capacity for speed, and that there was no evidence of a power plant. But this also appeared too flimsy to carry a man. Now, back to Taylor Grant in New York. There was important activity within the U.N. Security Council today. Welcome to Ancient Mysteries Revisited. I'm Rodney McGilvery. And I am Bruce Cunningham. And for today's show, we've got a special guest that actually was the keynote in my very first conference that I ever held for Ancient Mysteries International back in 2012. We are here today with Christopher Dunn. Uh, Christopher is a researcher, an engineer, and an author that I have known for several years. In fact, he is was the keynote of the very first conference that I ever had here in Fort Wayne back in 2012. So I guess we'll start by saying hello, Chris. Welcome to the show, hello, Chris. Hello, Bruce. How are you? Very good. Excellent. So I guess we'll just get into it, uh, just who you are and uh, what you do and what you've done and kind of how you got into uh, all the stuff that you've done. Okay, well, the... Uh I'll give you the uh, a brief overview. Um, my uh, my journey started, uh, as, you know, when I started an apprenticeship in, in Manchester, England, uh, at the age of 15, and and then uh, having uh, received my journeyman papers, I applied for a job in the, in the states, and I emigrated in 1969, and uh, so it's been a a journey of of growth and uh, an experience and education in the manufacturing and engineering field um, that brought me to actually connecting with uh, with Peter Tompkins' work, uh, Secrets of the Great Pyramid, and that was in 1977. And I started to uh, write the Giza Power Plant in 1977, mm -hmm. and in that book I described the Great Pyramid as a power plant rather than a tomb. Well, uh, the book, the writing started in 1977. It didn't uh, get published until 1998, so 20, 
21 years later, mm. uh, the book hit the uh, hit the shelves and uh, became quite successful. I mean, not uh, certainly not a uh, not a Dan Brown uh, mystery novel mm. that uh, you know scores millions of sales. But uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it keeps going. And here we are, another 21 years down the road. And um, it, and it's still plugging away. It's, you know, people still have uh, an interest in it. So <clears throat> it's uh, essentially, it was a, more of a reverse engineering uh, project. But then as I got further into the research and... Uh, and accessing the the work of uh, William Flinders Petrie and other researchers, and then traveling to Egypt several times, I connected with uh, the the manufacturing technology that the ancient Egyptians were obviously uh, in possession of when they crafted their their monuments and the uh, and there, there's some absolutely incredible. Uh, complex geometries that are crafted with extreme precision, which is kind of out. It's kind of an out of place um, uh, artifact in a way, in that <clears throat> when you consider uh, the time period for when these these structures were created, uh, uh, it's reported to be 5,000 years ago, and uh, when the Egyptians had nothing more than you know, copper chisels or uh, stone pounders and wooden hammers or whatever, uh, and and it, it's uh, it was surprising to find extreme precision on some artifacts, some within you know just a thousandth of an inch over a, a fairly large uh, length, and and the uh, and so it's that precision that I connected with and the the geometry. And accuracies were uh, out of place for a, a, a culture that just by just using simple tools, and and so I had an article published in 1984. It was a, it was taken from the book I was writing. It was called "Advanced Machining in Ancient Egypt," <clears throat> and that seemed to uh, connect with a lot of people. They found that to be uh, uh, sufficiently outrageous that they uh, they started discussions about it and then when the internet came uh, came around in 1995 uh, there was a, a group on uh, Deja News that um, there was a huge debate going on about this this theory of the ancient Egyptians using ultrasonics to to uh, craft their, their artifacts and um, I, I was actually surprised at the uh, uh, the acrimony, uh, you know, that that arose because of it. It was like uh, people were, um, you know, a little put out that somebody had come along and and suggest that the uh, the Egyptians were more advanced than we previously believed. And you know, I thought that uh, I thought that people would like to hear that, you know, and. And, uh, and obviously they didn't. So, <laughs> but the Egyptians now they've cut, they're coming around to it, and that that seems okay. to be a, a very uh, that's very satisfying for me to travel to Egypt because they're they're on board with the with the idea or the uh, the knowledge that that their ancestors were more advanced than than say the Romans or the the Greeks, which. Uh, which seem to feed into the you know the Western worldview as far as uh, the the progress of technologies and science. But, yeah, with advanced societies, yeah, you would think the Greeks, but with the work you've done and others after you, I mean, it it appears uh, with an engineer like yourself that some of that stuff we could only do now with a CNC machine or something like that. Um, you know, it's it's very interesting. Interesting, it's like. There are some artifacts where you could say, well, no, so I, I mean, you could do that with uh, a machine. It would require a machine, but the machine didn't have to have you know, a computer guidance, um, you know, or the software associated with it. Okay. But, the, um, but then there are some uh, artifacts where, you know, while I'm trying to be a little more conservative and not, you know, push the envelope too far, I mean, what we have to do is find... 
what is the what are the minimum requirements for making this okay um and there are some uh, people just say no th- this can't be done by hand it can't and even with um a machine with you know mechanical axes that uh the tool will travel along the uh, the the shapes and the complexities are as such and the uh, symmetry is such that these uh you would have to have some kind of machine that had a sophisticated guidance to it and then of course you know when we look around uh, to see what we have uh that sophisticated machine is uh, is computer numerical control mm. where uh, where um, the geometries are programmed into a computer in in 3D and then back to the computer will uh, create machine code in order for that the the machine understands uh, to control the movement of the axes. So yeah, it's a uh, it's. You know, it's, it's it's easily said, um, just like it's easily said that oh, you know, well they had to have used lasers, and uh, or you know they were using methods that we have no knowledge of, and <clears throat> and we can't do it today. I think you know those those are equally uh, um, wrong in my opinion because you know we have we. We have very sophisticated ways of doing things in engineering these days, and <clears throat> the uh, and to say that there's no way that we can do it today is uh, is a mistake. Yeah, but generally, it, it, generally people who who make that claim really don't don't understand how modern engineers or what engineers are capable of doing today. Oh, so. for sure. Uh, but uh, my own my own a, my own take on that is just the difficulty. You know, using two ton and three ton and uh, even seventy ton blocks, the the difficulty even today would would surely be, I guess, difficult. It's difficult, yes, and um, and but it's not impossible. That's the thing. So you know, when it comes to when it comes to some of the artifacts, uh, that does leave us scratching our head and questioning. Well, how how did they do this? What about these? The, you know the 1,200 ton uh, blocks at uh, Baalbek, or the uh, you know the unfinished obelisk in uh, in Aswan, and then some of the finished obelisks that are standing at uh, Karnak, the Karnak Temple or the Luxor Temple. These are uh, I say significant artifacts that we you know we, we scratch our head and try to figure out how they do it and. Uh, you know, there was a a show on the, uh, the obelisk. It was uh, done by on Nova a few years back. Uh, Mark Lano was involved in it. Mm. And Roger Hopkins, who is a stonemason, and they they attempted to uh, raise an obelisk. I think the obelisk was about 25 tons, and you know that's that's a small fraction of, of the the weight of the some of the obelisks that are even that are standing even today. Um, do you think these artifacts and monuments and such, do you think they were created on site where they're located, where you found them, or do you think they were manufactured elsewhere at a different location? Um, I think, you know, I mean, obviously you can't, if you detect a certain method, uh, and you can say with, with certainty that, say, that, you know, you have the, the boxes in the Serapium, um they they were you can say that they were actually um roughed uh rough finished and uh, prior to shipment so they would have been rough finished at the quarries or near the quarries where the the stone was taken from and then they were shipped to the the site the destination and the, and then finished there i mean the <clears throat> the evidence that that um, this was the case. You can you can find that at the uh, the Serapium, where they have these underground underground tunnels and crypts, where there are about 24 uh, very large granite boxes. There's one basalt box, which is a uh, 
a very nice piece, but they're all very precisely finished on the inside and some of some on the outside, but mostly the inside is very, very precise and accurate and square, except for one that's uh, that's uh, in one of the passageways and hasn't been installed in the crypt, and that is rough on the outside and on the inside. So, it, obviously, they were <clears throat> bringing the stone, bringing the boxes to the Serapeum uh, in in a rough shape. Uh, oh, you know, rough, rough machined or rough cut, um, and then bringing them under, you know, under underground into the, the into the passageways, and then uh, finishing them underground. Mm-hmm. Probably, and I would surmise is that um, the temper temperature differentials from the outs- the outside up in the on the desert floor, and the, then the cool confines of the passageways uh the uh if you had finished it with the precision that we find on these stones on the outside then when you brought them in the temperature dif- difference would cause uh, changes in the, in the, the stone okay. and you would have uh, inaccuracies show up as as the uh, the stone uh, shrank or you know it was uh Normalized in the temp in, the, in a different temperature. Okay, uh, that's something that we understand in manufacturing that when uh, when you're f- actually finishing like a gauge or something like that to a higher order of precision, maybe one or two ten thousandths of an inch, um, then you would um, <clears throat> you would finish it or you would uh, inspect it and finish it in uh, in a temperature controlled room. Um, and um, and generally those are held to certain standards. Uh, and 68 degrees is the standard for a, a precision or uh, you know a, uh, an inspection department. And that's about the same degrees as a like a tunnel or a cave or something like that would be correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, <clears throat> those passageways can can get uh, quite humid and hot with uh, with when you when you have a lot of visitors going through there, uh, when I when I first started uh, when I first went into the Sarapim, it was 1995, and they didn't allow people in there, and they hadn't allowed people in there for a long time, and uh, and it wasn't until 2006 they saw that this would, you know, uh, would be a nice addition for tourists to okay. be able to see. So they uh, started to uh, secure the tunnels with these arched uh, uh, I-beams and, uh, and and to finish it off so that people were safe walking through there, but but it wasn't considered safe before then. Okay. And now it's open to the public, and people are going through it all the time. Yeah, we, we had uh, Katrina Hutchins on our past show, and she was talking about that that she had been down there in the Serapium and seen those boxes and such. Yeah. And what, well, yes. What, I mean, and uh, it's it's great that we have people doing that now, and uh, you, we have a lot. You have a lot of engineers now who are are, um, are connecting with with the capabilities of the ancient Egyptians and coming up with their own assessment. How so do you How do you think like, the uh... Uh, I I'm <laughs> I was leading the charges. You know, it's very funny, but. Uh, I was leading the charge in 1984 when I had my first article published, and then in one of the uh, one of the discussion groups I was engaged in, uh, somebody uh, s- described me as a uh, as a, a lone wolf, you know, crying out into in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you look 1984, and here we are in you know, 2019. I would I would well imagine because. The interest has grown so much uh, just since I've been involved in probably like 2010. Right, and it's not like uh, I didn't do anything that any of the newcomers <coughs> who are with the same qualifications would be able to do. It's like I, I, I was there uh, first, I guess. Well, and, and you, you first with a different eye. I mean, you know, you're everybody looks at something different. 
Yes, and uh, and I guess it was it took a certain a certain amount of uh, you know uh, oh I don't know independent thinking and to go against go against the grain and, and publish something so controversial. Uh, but, I, uh, I guess that's where I got into before we get uh, any farther. Is how what got you started on? the concept of the the great pyramid and maybe even more pyramids being a power plant what truly got you started on that that direction oh that there's the pyramids of the pyramids have always fascinated me ever, ever since i was a little kid and um but i i you know i we were all taught when we were in school that these are the tombs of the of the pharaohs and then as i i became you know, as I got older uh, and into my twenties, and started to re- discuss it more, uh, read more about it, um, it started to the, the whole tomb theory didn't sound correct to me. It, uh, you know, it seemed to me that the, the 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 scope of the of the project, just the enor- enormity of it. Um, when you start to learn about the Great Pyramid, you know, and and you learn that it's set on 13 acres, and the 13 acres are level within seven eighths of an inch, hmm. um, and uh, the pyramid is aligned within three minutes of a degree to true tr- north, and uh, all the other remarkable features. It's uh, it. it I became convinced that it was the state of the art for a advanced civilization, and um, and that state of the art is reflected in, in the structure, and the uh, uh, just like we are creating artifacts now, routinely every day, uh, some of them large, some of them small, but uh, generally we can look at some of our artifacts and say, yeah, uh, this is the state of the art in in the world today. Uh, if we go back 30 years, this device will look a, a whole lot different. Take a telephone, for instance, you know. Um, telephones today look a lot different than they did 30 yeah, years ago, sure. right, or 50 years ago. Uh, everything everything has changed. State of the art in, in, in automobiles, if you... You know, look at an automobile and the fit and finish on an automobile from the 1970s. You'll see that the state of the art has advanced since that time. And uh, the fit and finish on cars is a lot more precise than it used to be. It's because of the evolution of technology and the and the uh, evolution and improvement in the machines that we make to make these machines. So... <laughs> It's uh, it's it's all progress, right? In some ways, but I I believe those 1960s like uh, Impalas and Biscaynes might have been like the best cars ever built. They were they ran forever, easy to work on. Uh, so it's it's one yeah, one person's well, scope. I mean, it, it depends. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a baby boomer too, and uh, you know I look uh, I look into the past and I uh, and I have fond memories of the 70s and and. And late sixties, and driving a, a Dodge Lancer, you know, or uh, you know, a, a nineteen sixty-seven Camaro, which, uh, you know, I mean, but those cars back then, they were, they were, uh, were a dream to to drive and to work on. Correct. And uh, but you know, uh, you talk to a millennial, uh, they probably <laughs> disagree with you. Um, you know, if <laughs> you. Because millennials, they'll they'll you know buy a car. They probably won't even look under the hood, you know. Yeah, I um, I saw an ad on the TV the other day that they're going to be the newer cars coming out. You're going to actually have to use your smartphone just to be able to get in the car and operate the car. So yeah, the the technology is growing at a at a level that uh, maybe ancient Egypt had. <laughs> well, the cars oh, right now are yeah. smart cars, pretty yeah. much. Uh, yeah, I mean technology uh, is a it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? I mean, we can't live without it. Uh, but uh, the problem, the problem is, is that it, uh, if it is a problem, it, it the culture is t- 
totally uh, changed because of it. No, oh, it seems like right now everyone's relying on technology. It's making the society more lazy in my eyes. Or, or the the frightening part if the grid goes down. You know, we've got an entire generation, it would seem, that would have very, very minimal skills. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think that that situation has been true for, for a long time. Uh, it, we're just getting further and further away from uh, a primitive or simple lifestyle. Good point. And, uh, the, the knowledge and skills that you need to live that lifestyle. Yeah, for sure. Uh, now, we are, a lot of them, we, you don't need... You know, well, I guess we make. should get back to the power plant. When when did hey, you we get? Can do it if you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when did you get you know, into you know really come up with that concept of of the Great Pyramid being a power plant? The um, well, it was kind of like an awareness of the of the size of the Great Pyramid um, and the work that was put into it, and uh, <clears throat> my. Uh, my kind of uh, thoughts about that were that if uh, you know if a culture that can conceive of uh, design and build such a massive structure uh, they would have to invest an enormous amount of of resources into it and a good portion of the wealth of the co- of the country would be invested in it and um Normally, when a when a civilization that has that state of the art is that advanced, uh, invest in a project, normally they want something out of it, you know. Um, and so, what I, I just d- dismissed the idea that it was a tomb. I mean, all the all the uh, the features within the Great Pyramid and other pyramids don't really support. Uh, the notion that, that that it was built to house a dead pharaoh or a dead king—it's it was. Uh, <clears throat> it all speaks of precision engineering, and in my mind, uh, it has the precision of a machine, and it functioned as a machine. Now the question then, uh, back in 1977, when I was when I was uh, thinking about this and studying it. Uh, the question was, what did the machine do? And uh, and I know that at the, back in the 70s there was the the whole pyramid energy movement, and I I uh, I was aware of what was going on in that in that, uh, you know in that those discussions. And pyramid power. Pyramid power. There was that. Um, there was, of course, proponents of it, and then there were debunkers of it. But uh, my my, I thought that whatever whatever the Great Pyramid did, uh, or if you're going to you know answer the question, what what is the Great Pyramid for? How does it function? Uh, you have to explain all the evidence found within it, and so you have to have a very uh, all-encompassing theory or hypothesis that. Uh, Includes all the details that have been discovered ever since uh, modern man started to explore it, and and so going back, uh, you know, even to the 1700s, 1600s, when they were going inside the Great Pyramid and and doing research, and hoping to find vast treasures, you know. Uh, but the uh, for me, a lot of what they found actually feed into the theory of the Great Pyramid being a power plant. Yeah, cool. And uh, and then, you know, that, that kind of basic mindset, and as I was reading further, um, it occurred to me, it was just like a flash of inspiration, if you will, but it was like something dropped into my head, and, and, I, and, I, and I saw how the, how the whole thing functioned. The proverbial um, light bulb. Yeah, just like a like a light bulb, right? It just went off, and it's like, oh, okay. Uh, and so I started to follow that thread uh, because it, it the, the the idea was that energy uh, the the people talked about um, was energy coming from 
you know, the atmosphere, uh, whether it was, uh, whether it was, you know, cosmic rays or, or you know, uh, electricity or electromagnetism. I mean, uh, the, the, the thoughts were that the, these, these energies were coming from the outside and being directed into the center of the Great Pyramid. And what I excuse me, <clears throat> what I saw was uh, that the energy was actually coming from the Earth uh, and through the pyramid, and the energy that uh, was associated with uh, with seismic energy. You know, it was mechanical vibration rather than electromagnetism. But uh, as it as it turns out, with uh, uh, further research, it seemed like it's both now, uh, with some recent uh, uh, remarkable discoveries made by a NASA physicist, actually. And so that that uh, the concept of the, the power plant has been kind of strengthened with with some uh, fairly mainstream and solid solid research. Nice. In recent years, it seems like you've uh, done some tours with many en engineers. Can you unveil any of your findings, your personal findings? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Can you uh, unveil any of your personal findings that you've uh, uncovered with your recent tours with many engineers? Well, the, uh, you know, the one, one uh, engineer that uh, came on my tour in both 2018 and 2019 um, he has added, uh, you know, his own expertise. He's a, an engineer with Rolls Royce. Uh, his name is Eric Wilson. Uh, very, very, very bright, very smart guy. Um, <clears throat> but uh, he came. Uh, he met. I met him in 2017, and it was just uh, just after the. Uh, they had found the, the the void above the grand gallery, and um, and so when interesting, interestingly, uh, when when that was revealed and 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 publicized, uh, he called me, and because he said, I, I know what that is, you know. In fact, I didn't think that your your theory. Uh, was as, was uh, workable uh, if this did not exist, mm. and so uh, it's th that void and the placement of it, its location, um, and of course we need to find out more about it. But that that, uh, that void above the above the grand gallery uh, uh, has a has a place in the in the Giza power plant. Uh, <clears throat> Because the, of the the nature of the energy that we're we're, we're working with, um, and it's not a uh, you know I mean it's it's something that that he was familiar with and understood, and but it, but I didn't. So he's added tremendous you know tremendous uh, knowledge to very nice to, to the to the to the research. Um, but it wasn't my discovery or it wasn't his discovery it was just his analysis of what has been revealed to the public by the scan pyramid team um i'm sure a lot of your listeners uh, have heard of the scan pyramid team it's mm -hmm. a consortium of uh, stakeholders uh, from uh, france japan and canada and they uh, are doing what they call muography where they're detecting muons that are coming through the pyramid, and the uh, their trajectory or their <clears throat> the uh, number of uh, muons that will strike a target that they set up targets is is changed if there are any open spaces wow. within the pyramid. How many, How long uh, has this scan pyramid team uh, been in existence? I think they've been at it since the early nineteen, early two thousand seventeen. Oh, very recent um, then. And uh, yeah, and it's fairly recent. Yes, I mean it's it's re recent recent research. And the um, 
and they're they're still doing it. I mean, we were there in uh, 2018, um, 2019. We were um, we were in Egypt in March, and they were still at it in 2019. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, and in fact. <laughs> uh, the uh, Rolls Royce engineer Eric uh, met the the Scan Pyramid team um, on the Giza Plateau. It's a funny story. I'll tell you. We were uh, actually south at Aswan, and uh, and we were going to <clears throat> we were going to uh, be leaving the follow the uh, the following day, um, and it was uh, it was the, we were there the day that the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers were playing on, at the Giza Plateau, nice. and so uh, Eric and a, a couple of other travelers they want they wanted to uh, well they wanted to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, so they were they were talking to the director of the Great Pyramid, and the director of the Great Pyramid arranged for them to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Well, the problem that they ran into was the uh, timing. They got an earlier flight, uh, but the flight was delayed two hours, so they didn't get to. They got to the plateau just when uh, Chili Peppers were wrapping up. Oh my! <laughs> and so uh, the uh, the director of the, the Great Pyramid, uh, Hamad Al Gindi, who is a is a wonderful wonderful young man, he was following in uh, Zai Hawass's footsteps. Uh, so, uh, he felt sorry for them, and so he invited them, invited Eric and them to uh, meet the Scam Pyramid team the for- following morning. And so Eric went up and spent the, the day with the Scam Pyramid team, and they were having problems with with uh, the electronics in their equipment, and so he uh, he repaired the equipment wow. for them and got it up and running. <laughs> wow, so missing the the chili peppers was definitely a very uh, synchronistic moment. It was, and it was, uh, you know, it was obviously it, it's uh, it was his dream. I mean, I mean, how could, I wouldn't even put something like that on my bucket list. You know, it's kind of like, well, yeah, uh, that's not going to happen, right? It is. <laughs> but it seems like. Uh, it's it's been a, a joy to to work with with him and and Robert Walter and uh, Mohammed Ibrahim, who is the Egyptologist we work with. But they're both they they're all you know incredible people. And then some of the other guests, Carmen Miller, who is uh, a brilliant uh, entrepreneur woman who whose father invented a uh, a free energy device and. Uh, and so Eric's been working with her, and the you know it's just like the team, the team seems to uh, uh, be uh, accomplish accomplishing more um, than uh, you know in in just a couple of years than I've done in in twenty years well, in it, terms of advancing advancing the ball, you know. Well, it seems a lot because what you're saying is a lot of the locals, like you said, the director of the pyramid, the Egyptologist, are, are seem to be, you know, uh, supporting what you guys are doing. Very much so. And the interesting thing, while I was there, I met another wonderful man, um, uh, and he was he's a professor at uh, Cairo University. Dr. Gal Hassan, and he was uh, he has uh, was writing. He's written many diff- many papers on uh, on ancient Egyptian technologies, and uh, I I was sent a link to his paper before I went to Egypt this year, and he had he had cited my work in the paper about seven different times, and so I sent him an email and, and thanked him for it. Uh, congratulated him on the on the paper, nice. and uh, he was delighted to hear from me. Um, we actually met in Luxor. Where he was uh, doing a seminar in Luxor, and we met there. Uh, very, very nice. Very now, was, nice man. Was that a planned meeting, or was that one of those synchronistic meetings? Well, it, it was synchronistic, but it, it was planned that it was at the last minute. It okay. was like a last minute thing. So it's not like I, you know, organize the tour and write, <laughs> and 
right at the same time I was organizing it, all these pieces were, were were in place. So I mean, you know, I mean, if you've ever been to Egypt, the things happen uh, in very mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so these were kind of little side events that that, that uh, showed up later. That's just really really cool. I guess yeah. one one other question. Uh, yourself and many of the people you work with, what is their take on, do you really believe that the pyramid is 5,000 years old or very much older? What, what really is the take on that? You know, that's a, that is an interesting question. It's a perennial question. And, uh, and I, I think in the alternate field, um, I think we're, we're fairly... Uh, fairly uh, decided uh, uh, and uh, in agreement that the that the uh, pyramids were much much older than 5000 years and because we I, I mean, me personally I I, I put them back I, I would be surprised if they were 36000 years old um, the um, because we have to go, but where, if we want to look for a time and place where a, a, an advanced culture existed, uh, where just a fraction, you know, just the, the skeleton of their civilization has, uh, has survived, we have we can look in uh, South America and we can look in Egypt and we see the, the pyramids are just really out of place uh, from the, um, the five thousand years ago, totally out of place. But if you go further back, we, you can. You get an understanding that if something really dramatic happened, a cataclysm, which of course there's evidence of that, uh, then you know a lot of the if we if the pyramids are the skeleton, well the you know the flesh and blood, uh, and uh, the, you know the the rest of the, the rest of the body has has been stripped away. And all you're left with is the bones. But what we see in the bones is something fairly sophisticated, and so it's just a matter of trying to determine, you yes. know, what the, the rest of the, the civilization yeah. looked like. What a, what a difficulty! I mean, now we have it, new, it, new discoveries. Yes, we have new discoveries, like in Bosnia and then Gunung Padang that I've been to in uh, Indonesia. Where where they're even carbon dated to like twenty five and thirty thousand years old, so it's the the mystery is is getting closer. Hopefully, the answers. Yes, and uh, you know the thing is is that now what we have is uh, tourism for Egypt is very very uh, important, very valuable, and the at the same time, you you have the the Egyptologist tour guides um, who are interfacing with uh, Western engineers on a daily basis. And so they're seeing that, you know, the uh, books like mine, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, uh, and the Giza Power Plant, they're, they're seeing that there there is um, some credibility to it with, with these... Uh, tourists uh, who are, have an engineering background because you know they're, ca they're carrying the books with them and mm -hmm. uh, using them to guide them uh, through some of the sites so in talking to Mohammed he is leading the charge now uh, in Egypt as far as uh, explaining to his guests the capabilities of uh, the ancient that Egypt. is so cool and uh, I actually, when we were on, we were at the on the Giza plateau, and I was using my straight edge in a square on uh, one of the artifacts there near the Valley Temple, and uh, and so after showing the guests, you know, the precision of them, um, I gave the tools to Mohammed, and I said, "Here you go, Mohammed." <laughs> You use them. Let's see how you do. And so he used them, and it's like, yeah, okay, you're good. You can keep them now. Um, <laughs> you can you can borrow them so that every group you take through Egypt, you can show them with my tools how precise <laughs> the artifacts are. <laughs> and so he was like, he was t a little taken aback, but absolutely delighted. 
Uh, I said, no, I'm not giving them to you. Mm. <laughs> They're just loaning them. I think I think when I look when I first met you and read your material, I think that's what really uh, was so different between what you were doing and many is your background was engineering versus metaphysical, paranormal. Uh, so I think that's the strength of what you've you've been doing done in your career. Well, I, you know, it's a it's a fortunate position to be in because um, I. I may have detractors, but, but I have very few, if any, uh, engineers who um, who come out against me. Uh, you know, uh, most of the people who say negative things about my work are, come from different backgrounds, yeah. so they they don't connect with the evidence the way I do or other engineers do. And I try to explain it in detail. Uh, and I've been accused by some engineers of being, you know, too uh, too cautionary in 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 my, uh, my assertions on on the level of technology. Do we just come out and say it? Quit fussing <laughs> around, you know. <laughs> you know, there there is that. Well, you know, but that's the thing. You see, it's like um, it's like they. There is so much that uh, that we take for granted uh, in as engineers that uh, other people uh, have, have no knowledge of. It's like we we can walk through, we can look at artifacts, and we can imagine you know everything, all the the uh, <clears throat> the the basis for the manufacturing of, of say a cell phone or something like that. Um, uh, the images of the machines used to to create them and the uh, technologies behind them just uh, are just like they're present. They're in your in your mind as you hold hold your cell phone. These are already held in your mind. But uh, um, a right, another person who doesn't have that background, all they see is the cell phone and they they know how to use it. But what it, what is behind it and the evolution of it, the manufacturing of it. Um, is is um, you know it's they don't see it. It's yeah. Not, oh, no doubt. I guess I, I got it, another cool question too. Is I'm dealing with a lot of different people that think they are making discoveries off of only looking at pictures. Would you agree that on site is so much more important than just even even with the modern satellite photography that's you know just truly incredible on on going to these ancient sites? But what's your take on that versus on site? Um, that's a that is a really excellent question, and uh, I can go back and and cite several instances where I have been. Uh, I've been asked to evaluate a photograph. Would you say this is machine? Would you say this is machine? And based on a photograph, I would say, well, I mean, you know, the photograph is, is very in interesting. Uh, it certainly um, enticing enough that I would um, invest in some measuring instruments. You know, depending on the size or what I what I could do. I, and, and go and look at it, but before claiming that it's uh, it has been machined, uh, I would need to take measurements because the uh, generally the hallmarks of machining are uh, uh, geometry and precision and consistency, accuracy, repeatability, on you know all of these uh, kind of inherent features on uh, machined artifacts. So. No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, make a, a strong assertion based based on just a photograph. I'm not saying that photographs are not interesting, and nor would I, um, nor would I uh, take a group uh, to Egypt and and uh, and, ha and expect them to uh, accept my. Analysis. If I wasn't actually demonstrating or showing them um, with with precision instruments, yeah, very nice. Uh, what I what I was referring to in terms of the precision, and and, and even you know just providing providing guests with uh, with reference something that they can connect with, like you know when we talk about the precision of 
two ten thousandths of an inch. You know, what does that mean? Um, and it's like taking a uh, just a just one hair a piece just a hair out of your head and slicing it down the length of it ten times and then one of those slices is going to be uh, two ten thousandths of an inch. That's, that's and that's and when you t explain it that way, then it's like whoa. And you know, I mean that that is very very precise. Well, that means very they were really precise. good with those copper chisels, then, without question. They were excellent with those <laughs> copper chisels. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, My goodness! You know. During your tours, did you come across any evidence of further advanced technology? Like I've seen some hieroglyphs that look like helicopters and various space spacecraft and whatnot. Yeah, those um, um, those were <laughs> interesting. The, um, I, I, they, they're not, though, I mean, they are not, uh, they're not helicopters. I mean, they may resemble a helicopter, bec but because of the combined image, they, they uh, are actually what they call the polymstet, and uh, that's where you have um, a later culture uh, who will come along and kind of add their own image on top of another image um, and the original image would be you know uh, hieroglyphs or uh, reliefs that are cut into the stone and then they were plastered over that and then put their own oh, okay. uh, hieroglyphs on it uh, <clears throat> and then what happens is some of the plaster will uh, slough off and uh, it will leave a combination of uh, the modern, uh, the more modern image, and uh, then the the old image. And so that combination is what you find at Abydos, where the uh, the famous uh, quote helicopter unquote uh, is on one of the architraves on the beams above in the hyperstyle hall. Okay, so so uh, it is an original carving. It's just been uh, messed with over the years. Yeah, and you know the problem is, is that there is a little dishonesty that has uh, <clears throat> that has uh, accompanied this kind of uh, these kind of proclamations, and that is the uh, there's one image that was going around, and they had photoshopped it. They photoshopped all the uh, everything out except the part that re loosely resembles. <laughs> A helicopter. So, um, and I think a space shuttle and a speedboat, or if I'm not mistaken, yeah, that, yeah. something I like mean, that. Th these are these are very interesting, but they're not, you won't find them in in my books. I, I don't make those claims. Well, you just need to uncover one of those uh, space shuttles in one of your you know one of your uh, searches. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know it's interesting though. I mean. That's very good advice. I'd love to do that. And, you know, it's, uh, I have had people who say, well, you know, you should have done this and you should have done this and you should have done this. And and it's like people will sit in their armchairs and make judgments of somebody who is actually investing the money and their time uh, and taking risks and going out and doing research. And then and then uh, it's not enough for some somebody who... who you know, think 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 she should have done it this way or this way <laughs> and this way. Well, if you think, you know, if, if my work is not good enough for you, then go do it yourself. Well, I, that's, that's where I my say. question came from about the on-site, because I am getting so many people, and, and I mean, they're respected researchers and friends, but they're still thinking they got, you know, they're making discoveries off of just these satellite images and stuff. And I'm like, well, I think there still needs to be excavation involved, uh, truly. Yeah, who's to tell what was doctored in those photos and what wasn't in yeah. those? Well, yeah, the, uh, obviously, uh, when, I think there was a recent embarrassment for one of these uh, satellite archaeologists where they claimed there was a pyramid and based on satellite photographs, and it turns out that it wasn't. It was some modern structure, but they had uh, misinterpreted the photograph. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I'm seeing a lot. And, I mean, they're doing great work, yeah. but there still needs to be much uh, research and excavation, I would I would think. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I think uh, 
everybody makes mistakes, you know. And and imagine that that research you would uh, the next time she sees something of interest, uh, she would uh, actually go check it out before before she does a press release. Yeah. So and and look like uh, what you've talked about of just the last three years that you've been doing these tours and the other teams, you know, the the advancement that. You know, since I've been involved in this, Chris, you know, which has been only about 10 years, it's right. it's just unbelievable what's going on. Yes, and and the thing is, is that in uh, in the West, uh, a lot of the uh, advancement in in the recognizing the true nature of the ancient Egyptians, that's going on in Egypt. I mean, uh, they are not. Uh, opposed to these ideas i mean they have they have uh try i mean the idea of the pyramids being far older the idea of the pyramids uh not being a tomb um that's a they do believe that it was it was a tomb they're still looking for khufu's burial chamber inside the great pyramid Hmm. and that's what Ostensibly, this uh, Cascan Pyramid team are looking for is the uh, Khufu's oh my uh, burial chamber. But at the same time, they're trying to accommodate uh, what is obvious now to you know the education of the of the population in Egypt has uh, has advanced so much that their own engineers are now saying, hey, you know, this there's something more to this, that is, and we great. need to. We need to incorporate that in in our uh, in our history, and um, and so now they they seem to be uh, incorporating it in a way where they would say, yeah, well, the uh, the pyramids may not have originally been used as a uh, as as tombs, but um, they were later by the by the Egyptians. They are. Uh, they have no problem with thinking about um, the Egyptians actually being around for thousands of years more, uh, suffering with a cataclysm and then uh, rebuilding, but, but not quite to the level that they were before. Which so, but they they're opposed to the idea of people coming in and saying, "Well, the Egyptians." didn't do this you know it must have been uh, aliens they're very <laughs> opposed to the idea of the uh, taking the credit away from their ancestors and giving it to somebody else and so and i don't do that so uh, they seem to be very warm and open to the idea of uh, of their culture being elevated in the world in terms of their their technology and you know it's interesting i was at the unfinished obelisk and asked one and the uh, the books there's a bookstore there now. Um, when I first went there, it was 1986, and there was nothing there. There wasn't even, you know, you didn't even have to buy a ticket to go and see it. You just pulled up at the side <laughs> of the road and walked in there. But now they've got a this whole welcome center. They've got a, a little theater where they show they show movies. And uh, they have the the usual uh, gift shops, and there's a bookstore there. Uh, Mohammed came out uh, with a guy who says, "Chris, Chris, come here. Uh, they've got your book in the bookstore." And so the the shop owner comes out with a copy of my book, <laughs> and he was so he, he, such a charming charming man, you know, very delighted to to meet me. And so I was uh, I happily signed the book for him, and. Uh, and I said, do you want me to sign it to you? And he said, no, no, no. He said, no, just, just sign your name. I want to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's and an so, entrepreneur. Uh. <laughs> he wants to sell it. You know how much they were selling that book for at, at uh, Aswan, though? I mean, it's like they were selling them for $52 each. Signed by you. No. Even, oh, without even being without, signed by you. Even, oh, even without my signature. Okay. <laughs> How much are you going to sell it with the signature? signature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fifty-two dollars. Fifty-two dollars for a book. I'm like, whoa. You know, it's, normally, I mean, uh, the cover price. Uh, 
here it's twenty five dollars. But you could buy it on Amazon for a lot less. Yeah, some so. of those some of those countries, Amazon and a lot of that's just so not so easy. I was surprised I was just in the Shanghai airport when I come back to the States and I couldn't yeah. get on Facebook. There's no Facebook in China. Oh, yes. right. Exactly. I was, I was yeah. you know, I was trying to get on it like what's you know, what's wrong? And then I got to thinking, Oh, I know what's wrong. So yeah, yeah. Amazon wouldn't be available everywhere for sure also. Right. No, no, that's it. They uh they don't want to corrupt their people with uh with software like Facebook. I mean, my goodness. The number of uh opportunities for growth and friendship and you know, uh <laughs> Through Facebook, you won't, won't want that for your cult, for your people. <laughs> or, you? or all the false information you can put out there nowadays seems like it's almost like mainstream TV. <laughs> well, yeah, there is that, and you know, there, you have to you have to maintain a high level of skepticism all the time. Yeah, you get, and you, it's not just Facebook; it's just oh, that, it's everything. You got to do research. Uh, That's exactly when I do a post. I always put like a a question mark, or I'll put if this is true. It, it just you need to because you, it takes research. There's just no question. Now, with that in mind, are your books that you've written are they strictly 100% uh, references to your tours that you've done and your personal research, or do you include like your theories? Um, well, the first book is, uh, it, it doesn't say, uh, I mean, uh, if your question is to, about, uh, does it refer to my tours in my books? Yeah, is I it all just strictly based on your, your findings? No, your it's tours? just based on the, on the evidence. Okay. Um, they're, they're mostly, yeah, the, the Giza power plant, it has the the theory of the Great Pyramid being a power plant. The lost technologies of ancient Egypt uh, is, uh, you know, a, a deep dive into the manufacturing uh, capabilities of the ancient Egyptians and, and uh, highlights a lot of the, a lot of evidence. Uh, it presents the uh, f- further research on certain elements that were in the, uh, uh, in the Giza power plant, such as the ultrasonic machining of, of uh, granite, and uh, and then of course the the newest discoveries of the uh, symmetry and precision on the Ramsey statues, and that takes up a, a few chapters. Yeah. Um, and the last chapter on the uh, hyperstyle hall at the at the Temple of Dendera, which is a remarkable remarkable structure. Um, and listeners can go to my website, it's geezerpower.com, um, and there are some articles uh, there, and I need to update it. I see I still have my tour banner up there, but the uh, beneath the tour banner there is uh, Lost Technologies Tour of 2009. There's the Aberawash stone that uh, shows that uh, a curved, st- curved cut on a stone Indicating that it was it was uh, cut with a saw that was twenty uh, thirty seven feet in diameter, and then there's um, there are photographs from the hyperstyle hall, at the temple of Dendra, and then the symmetry and precision of Ramsey statues at the temple of Luxor. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's uh, lots of nice images there for your nice. for your listeners to go look at uh, if they wish. You just brought up that uh, the possibility of some harmonic and uh, ultrasonic tools. Uh, I remember when we first met, I've never forgotten that. Uh, you had you and the rest of the hosts, and it seems like almost every conversation ended up in harmonics or sound. And I've, I've always kept that with me, that how important sound is and how sound was. Oh, sure, yeah. And in fact... Uh you know, my research associate, Robert Robert Vorta, um, is a sound engineer. He's a brilliant guy. And uh, I thought, thought that one of the areas of the Giza power plant that needed to be fleshed out a little more um, was the uh, the acoustics part of it. And not being a, a sound engineer myself, I reached out, out to, uh, to Robert, and uh, he's been very helpful. 
Way cool. Um, but yeah, there's a there's been a lot of a lot of discussion on uh, the acoustics of the Great Pyramid. Yeah, we and yeah, we had made a discovery, and it wasn't our discovery, of course. But on uh, my last tour to Angkor Wat back in 2017. Uh, we see these chambers all over at every, almost every single temple there, and there is a plethora of temples in the Angkor Archaeological Park. And it turns yeah. out they were all sound chambers of some sort. There, there's no question yeah. about it. You can beat on your heart, yeah. and it echoes. And it's it, we we were not aware of that before. Wow. Yeah. Um, I know. There's there's a lot of these uh, these places, uh, the Barabar Caves in India. I mean, those those are absolutely very remarkable. Um, there's a lot of a lot of these ancient sites. Uh, it seems like these ancient societies possibly use these, at least with their ancient temples, these sound frequencies um, to be used as healing frequencies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. in Egypt, right. don't they actually even have, that's what I've heard, I don't know if it's true, like they still have some uh, hospitals that do use some sound healing and such, and that kind of holistic stuff. Yes, there's a uh, guy in England, um, sound bathing, he does uh, forest bathing and sounding. His name is uh, uh, oh, Gary. Oh, he's going to kill me after oh. I got his last name. <laughs> well, they can find it on your website, I'm sure. Wonderful guy, wonderful guy. But uh, oh my, it's it's uh, tough getting old, isn't no. it? No. Yes, we we all do resemble that remark, or will resemble that remark soon. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, like I said, the sound, and uh, I think there's little doubt how important sound is for sure. And I mean, your your research is is part of it and the team you've assembled and i hope we uh plan a angkor wat tour again next april in 2020 and i sure would love to have mr christopher dunn uh, along with that tour <laughs> oh boy <laughs> i think you've heard me say that before chris <laughs> yeah yeah uh, i uh <clears throat> there's so much so much in the world that would be absolutely amazing for me to see and i i just love it uh, I am tentatively organizing a conference in Cairo for next May. Oh, nice! So, um, yeah, I, I I've cut back a lot on my activities. You know, doing more around uh, around home, my hometown here in Danville, Illinois, oh, my adopted hometown. <clears throat> so, um, I'm I, I was invited to speak at a uh, symposium in India uh, uh, this past a April, I mean, I mean past February, and unfortunately I had to turn that down um, because I don't want to, you know, I, wa I, I want to be focused and I don't want to be distracted too much. That's, um, that's easy enough to do for sure. I mean, uh, two of my bucket list sites are in India. The Elora Caves and the, the Kailash site are definitely on my bucket oh list. Oh, my God, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see those. Are you kidding? Yeah, those are amazing. I mean, even looking at the photographs, you don't have to, I don't know, sure it is. Don't have to say, you know, is this machine, this machine. I don't think they oh. look like they were machines, yes, but they uh, are certainly remarkable uh, achievements. Yeah, remarkable for sure. achievements. For sure. So what what's on your, your list for uh, this year here? Do you have anything, like you said, you were planning next year. Do you have anything going this year except for finishing your book, of course? Yeah, the, um, well, you know, I've, I've actually been concentrating on the renovation of a, a grand old opera house here in Danville, Illinois. And, uh, you know, the little bit I can do. Uh, <clears throat> to help, but uh, that has been taking up some of my time. Um, the I've got a conference in uh, Newport Beach in October. It's the uh, CPAC. Uh, oh, in California. Is, yeah, yeah. So Walter Crossenden's uh, yes. conference. So that's I'm looking forward to that because he always puts on a, the most excellent, excellent conference. That's in October. Um, 
first week, weekend in October, I think. Then, uh, and you know, after that, you know, I'm 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 trying to concentrate on getting getting the book finished, and that's going fairly slowly right now, but hopefully it'll speed up here. <laughs> what yeah. is your what's your current book going to be titled? And give a little uh, summary if you want. Well, it's uh, you know since the the publication of the Giza power plant, um, the uh, people have been asking me for an up. You know, are you going to write an update? Are you going to write a sequel? Are you going to write this? And I always said that I you know I will I will write another book when I have something significant to say. I'm not just going to start churning out books just to churn out books and uh, saying the same thing or presenting the same thing over and over. And so um, when I start when I started to write Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, uh, I had amassed a, a significant amount of new information that I could share in that book so it was it was a new book new information wasn't the same old thing so that's done and i pro i'm not i'm not going to go back um uh, and write another book on on ancient machining because um i think you know as far as um you know you you, you want to you want your work to influence uh people that you hope that it will be taken seriously, and it seems that that book has influenced a lot of people, and it's been taken seriously by the people that matter to me. Um, and so that is very satisfying. There, I don't need to do that that again. Other, other people can uh, can take up the torch and uh, you know and, and discuss it. And I think uh, I think your book, The Giza Power Plant, is probably one of the most important books that's been written in the last, you know couple three decades because it has spurned so many to go that direction and uh try to discover more in that in that area yes and you know i i really didn't get into the power plant theory and uh, lost technologies uh but now um <clears throat> since the publication of the book there's been so much new information discovered um inside the great pyramid that um, I have I, I addressed uh, individually uh, with articles on my website, and also uh, uh, articles published in uh, like Atlantis Rising or something like that. Yeah. It's... But but these uh, these new observations or discoveries uh, have not you know I haven't written them in a in a book form or updated the book. And now I have there is in, enough of that information, remarkable new information, oh. uh, that uh, actually I could write the sequel to the the Giza power plant, and you know, and I think that uh, I think people are going to be amazed at the uh, at how how much information has 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 been revealed since its publication that actually supports the original premise that's the that's that's you just need to get that book uh finished uh chris so we can read it i do yeah <laughs> and it doesn't have to be a very very thick book you know i mean it's, it could be a, a short book but oh i don't know though <laughs> that's what i <laughs> once you get once said. you get after it, it it keeps growing eh well yeah you, you, i set your sights uh you know on a uh on a small book, you think, oh, yeah, I can knock that out in six months. And then here you are 20 years later still <laughs> trying to knock it out. <laughs> are your uh, new discoveries about the Giza power plant, do they support your previous theories regarding it being used as a power plant? Or is it developing new theories because of your new findings? Um, no, I mean, it's essentially... It enriches the uh, original theory in a in a tremendous way. It gives it more weight, Good. Uh, and um, uh, and it's and it's really um, it's really amazing, amazing information. Particularly uh, the understanding of geophysics now uh, that's coming out of, of NASA and is being published. 
that is uh, is blending in or feeding into the, the whole concept of uh, pyramids as power plants. Then, you know, some of the uh, explorations from back in uh, the 2000s, well, like 2002, which is where they had uh, the exploration of the southern shaft in the Queen's Chamber and what was revealed behind the so-called Ghent and Brinks door uh, lends itself to the Giza power plant theory. And, uh, and I, you know, we'll talk about that. Then you've got the scan pyramid uh, information um, and some of the acoustics that, uh, that Robert Vorter has been, uh, has been working on nice. um, and analyzing that, uh, <clears throat> that feeds into it. So oh. it's all... It's all uh, it's all kind of supporting, you know. It's uh, self-referencing. It's, uh, it's reinforcing original. It's like disparate information, but when when looked at as a system, you know, as a total system, you can see, oh, okay. So this part really does support this part, even though, you know, mm. they are totally different. Uh, different processes going on, like the generation of hydrogen in the Queen's Chamber. You know, that is uh, a little different than the, uh, the generation of airborne sound in the Grand Gallery, um, which is different than, you know, the electromagnetic movement, le- movement of electromagnetic energy wow. inside the pyramids. And that's some other recent research wow. that has yeah, that's fascinating that stuff. Yeah, we can't wait for the book. My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're definitely getting you're, closer. You're making you're making some of the listeners drool, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, really a remarkable remarkable stuff, and I I, I I I sometimes you know I have to kick myself to say, do you realize what's going on here? You know, get on with it. You got to get that book out. <laughs> well, like I said, the, the, you know the discoveries that you're making and many are making, and just it's you know we're we're called ancient mysteries revisited. Well, we're getting closer and closer yeah. to solving at least a little bit yeah if you think yeah, about it this I'm, uh research that you're doing and is some of the most important research being done i i actually think it is and uh, you know and i uh, and it's not just, it's not my research you know that's the thing it's like uh other people are doing this research with a no thought of uh no thought or no objective of proving or disproving what I've written about, if they even know about what I've written. And um, and so it's like, you know, they're doing their independent research. I, as an interesting, uh, passionate observer of everything about the Great Pyramid, are t- taking their findings and saying, okay, does this uh, support the, the, the hypothesis or does it... Um, does it uh, reject it? You know, is it something that uh, would cause me to go back and say, oh, "Well, uh, it was a uh, very nice time, but I was wrong," or, or can I say, "Hey, wait a minute, hmm. this is a uh, you know, this this is confirmation of that particular part of the theory." Oh, that's cool. You you've done a lot of work in Peru too. Now, what's your take on that? Do you believe that the cultures, you know, five to 35,000 years ago were tied in together? Because it surely appears that, that way with the research that I've done personally. What's your take on that? Well, I, yeah, I mean, from an engineering perspective, um, Peru is, is a, a different animal altogether. I mean, it's, there's no comparison when you look at the, uh, the structures in Peru and what you what you find in Egypt, <laughs> but uh, you go to Bolivia and to Puma Punku, uh, that that has the strongest, I believe, the strongest evidence of of machining, what I would call artifacts that would uh, require a machine to be created, uh, because of the <clears throat> level of precision that they hold. Um, I'm not saying that in Peru you don't find precision. Generally, you find flat surfaces, and uh, and some of them are, are, are very, you know, very precise, within a half thousand. But the um, you, you can't argue that 
um, they were done by machines because people were making flat surfaces by hand before they had machines. Actually, you know, they had to make the first machine by hand, right? So, uh, so before machines were making machines, uh, they were done by handwork, and you can create a flat surface by hand. I mean, they were they were doing that when they were making these uh, uh, printing presses. Um, they would have a have to have a platen that was yes. extremely flat, and so their their techniques on doing that are, w- are well known and very old. But um, you brought up Puma Puku. That's something I think our listeners would like to hear. What some of your findings? If you've had, if you have any new findings on that, I don't really have any new findings on that. I was wanting to, uh, I was, was wanting to write a, a book on on uh, on Puma Puku, and uh, and then I I had you know several years of of. Uh, uh, medical issues that I had to take care of and I couldn't really revive the pa- any passion to uh, to go back to okay. Peru or go back to Bolivia and and continue with that with that work and um, it was because I I didn't have the passion to do it anymore that I had, had to reevaluate what my life and what, what was important to me because I, I figured that you know, I mean, I, 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 you can't do anything of real significance if you don't have a, a, a if you don't have a passion to do it and a focus. And so I had to had to recognize that my um, original passion lay with the great okay. with, with the great pyramid and the Giza power plant theory, nice. and that uh, that was where I needed to focus my time and. And so I, that's what I did. And then, of course, <clears throat> um, wanting to um, kind of grow my circle of, of friends or, you know, experts of my team, um, I, I arranged a tour in, in, uh, in March of 2018, and we had some wonderful people on that tour. Excellent, excellent, excellent people. Uh, very, very educated, highly educated people. Uh, professionals, all of them. And uh, and so that was very satisfying, and I was able to grow my team and uh, draw on expertise outside uh, of what was available to me before then. Nice. And so, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So that I kind of uh, turned away from South America. I, I mean, I, not not to totally ignore it, uh, but uh, and it, it is a beautiful place. You know, I mean, I love love Peru and and Bolivia. But I mean, I have a wonderful time there. But you, and it's jaw dropping. I mean. The, right. the feats of engineering that they did is uh, jaw dropping. But you've no got you've got your focus, and that's 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 good for all of us, especially when that new book comes out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to keep uh, you know giving me a kick in the backside. Well, I uh, I want to come up and kick. see I want to come up and see that uh, ancient opera house that you're you're involved with. That sounds really cool, and, and I hope to be get up there in the next maybe few weeks. Yeah, that you know, that's it's interesting. I had for my whole, the time I'd lived in Denver, which has been over thirty years now. Um, most of my time and focus has been outside of Denver, and uh, and and there was this really old opera house. They call it the Fisher Theater, down down on main on the uh, main drag, going through downtown, and. <clears throat> And I've been in it a few times, you know, and it's a, it's a really cool building, and it's so, but it had it needed a lot of it needed a lot of work. Um, it, I mean, it needed everything. <laughs> so, um, they had uh, a local not-for-profit board that um, managed it and kept it standing, and uh, but they were looking for funds to, you know, do renovations or even you know bring it up to code, which. Uh, significant work, 
uh, needed new trusses. Uh, all the, all the tr- trusses needed repaired. So some pretty serious uh, work. That was yeah, that's serious work. And so it was the yeah, uh, middle of 2017 when um, uh, my my wife asked me to play the narrator for the Rocky Horror Show. And I was like, no, I can't do that. You know, tell, I, tell me you videoed that if you did. <laughs> oh, no, that's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn it. Oh, so I got, yeah, I, I bought a, a, an Einstein wig, you know. And so I, I played the narrator and I had a blast. And that's it was in the old, this old theater. Oh. So but you have then, some pictures uh, of, of you playing that part at least. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to share them. <laughs> Was there a whole uh, performance of Rocky Horror? Yeah, Rocky Horror Show. Yeah, it was. Uh, <clears throat> it was really, really good. It was, it was a huge success. And nice. So, uh, That'd be great uh, to that, see that in an old a old opera house. A, a local philanthropist noticed there was a lot of activity going on. And he came forward and uh, got his contractor involved, and now the the, the theater's being restored. Very good. When, the, so, are they yeah. still doing some uh, shows in it? I mean, it is active. Oh, no, we can't do any any shows in it right now. Oh, okay. The the, the, the uh, interior is uh, uh, is full of scaffolding. They get got scaffolding up to the roof. Okay. Do you have an oh, estimated time problem. when this house will be? Open to the public again? Yeah, we're looking at a September opening sometime. In oh, September. this year? This year. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's good. We got well, a place the, here uh, in uh, Fort Wayne called the Embassy. It's a uh, early yeah. 1900, uh, uh, amazing uh, imported carved wood from Europe and such. And uh, I never put a penny in it to restore it, but I am so thankful that somebody did because it's it's a special place. Sounds like the place you're working with is the same. Yeah, this is uh, this is from uh, 1884. Oh wow! Yeah, and it was uh, originally it was heated the, the, with uh, four fireplaces that were in the auditorium. Wow! But it's uh, kind of a Art Nouveau kind of Baroque <laughs> style, uh, but beautiful plasterwork. Absolutely go- glorious pastor. Yeah, pastor that sounds really, really cool. And uh, so we've been up on the scaffolding, uh, doing the, the painting, painting the details. Um, and uh, we've had uh, a local artist come in, and he's painted a mural on the ceiling, which is really outstanding. Hmm. Very nice. So, very nice. Yeah. No, oh, that's cool. So yeah, my uh, I've been involved in theater ever since I was. A young lad back in England, and I've always loved the theater. Yeah, my my great nephew is uh, just graduating high school. He's one of the top youth actors in the state of Indiana, and he just got like a a full ride scholarship to Ball State's theater directing department. And it's just it's it's oh, it's, wow. a, it's a big thing for the family for sure. So yeah, I, I can yeah, I can appreciate great. what you're talking about. That's fantastic. So. so. I think we're really getting close to the end of the show now, and uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, interview, Chris, and I can't wait to get up your way and see that theater and maybe have a uh, an Irish ale together. Well, that's possible. Um, yeah, uh, just let me know when you when you come in my way. Yeah, I will do that. And uh, give, your, give your website and any kind of uh, stuff you got on and how to contact you or your, your material online. Yeah, it's uh, geezerpower.com, www.geezerpower.com. That's the uh, the website. Okay, very good. And do you have a release date on your upcoming book? No. Uh, okay. No, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I'm sure there's some magazine articles. I remember reading uh, the one you talked about, those giant saws in Giza, uh, in Lannis Rising, many years ago, actually. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So people could look for your your articles in Lannis Rising, maybe New Dawn, and some of the other magazines out there, as well as online on your your Giza Power site. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the, uh, the the information, a lot of it, um, 
is a, is in the, my book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. Okay. So the, the Aberawash, the soil of Aberawash, and the uh, Temple of Dendera, the Ramsey statues, and other articles um, are contained within the Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt book. Okay, very good. Well, Chris, it was a pleasure having you on our show. Well, thank you. Uh, it's been a very nice conversation. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for joining us, and until next time, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Well, that was Chris Dunn, author of The Geezer Power Plant and Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. Yes, and uh, we appreciate Chris being on. He's working on some new stuff. And again, uh, geezerpower.com will give all the information you look for on uh, Chris's work and... We hope to have him back on the show when he finds out even more discoveries in Egypt. And I'm Bruce. And I'm Rodney. And join us every week, Mondays at 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on WELT, streamed at www.acpl.com. Dot info slash wealth. And we run in again on Wednesdays at 2 a.m. And archived at Radio Free America. Until next time, we'll see you out there.